What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. It is super early in the morning, and I don't usually do tutorials in the morning, but I have a really, really busy day today. So I wanted to get this done and out of the way. Um, it's, a, it's a highly requested tutorial. We're going to talk about how to build a custom responsive grid in Oxygen. And we're not going to be using utility classes. We're going to be using the grid builder in Oxygen. And this is, I, you know, I wanted to do a grid builder tutorial, but I don't want to do something boring like let's just go through every setting in the grid builder and explain how it works. What I'd rather do is just build a real world thing. And I also want to throw in some uh, some jujitsu type tricks, right? Like some grid jujitsu. Uh, we're going to do a staggered grid. And we're going to do a staggered responsive grid that auto staggers. I don't know. Let me just show you an example, okay? Instead of trying to explain it. So I'm going to screen share. I pulled up Trello.com because a, a lot of sites use this technique online. But, uh, you know, I was just looking around to try to find a quick example. And Trello's site happens to have one. So if we start scrolling down here, you're going to see that a lot of times when companies are trying to demonstrate features or talk about features. They use this kind of grid where it's an, a, an image or an asset and then feature text. And then you come down and it staggers. So there's it's asset on the left, content on the right, content on the left, asset on the right, asset on the left, content on the right. You get the picture, right? Of course, when you drop down to mobile on something like this, so if we inspect this, and bring up our mobile editor here, you, you come down and you see what has to happen. Now Trello's, um, you know, they do it a little bit different than I tend to do it. Like right here, they kind of go really small with the asset. Uh, and the text really hasn't changed much, um, but then they finally stack. And when it stacks, what you're gonna notice is the asset always comes before the content. So you have asset content, asset content, asset content. That's how it's, nice and clean. You don't want it to be asset, content, content, asset. That doesn't that doesn't make any sense for the flow of the page. So let me get out of responsive mode here. So what we have to do is we have to use the grid builder in Oxygen. We're not gonna be using utility classes, vanilla Oxygen grid builder. And I'm going to explain how the grid builder works as I go through this tutorial. This is what I would say as, let me let me go back to camera here. This is like a follow along tutorial. Don't just watch this tutorial. If you are not super familiar with the grid builder in Oxygen or you want to know it better and be more confident with it, follow along with this tutorial. Open up a blank page and let's go step by step through this little tutorial here and then you will be confident because what we're also going to do if you if you look here, we also have to think about spans because if you notice this asset side is smaller than the content side. This is wider, this cell over here is wider than this cell right here. So in this tutorial, we're gonna cover column spans, which is really important when you're building custom grids, you really wanna know uh, the power of column spans. So we're gonna cover that as well. So you're gonna learn a lot in this tutorial, but you're not going to learn a lot if you just watch the tutorial. I really want you to follow along with this. So this is what we're going to build right here. I have a blank page set up here, and we're just going to dive right in. So I'm going to hit add, and we're going to first add a section. We're also going to talk about you know best practices with custom class names and things like that. Uh, I really encourage you to, when you're building, you can go for speed, just like how fast can I get this done, or you can go for here's how to do it right. Here's the best practices. And every time I build a grid or every time I build a component on a website, I am going to implement best practices to my best ability, right? There's always things that you're gonna get better at in the future, but you definitely want to implement best practices at all times and not go for speed, right? You go for speed and then bad things happen with future proofing and being able to edit the website easily in, you know, uh, at some point down the road. So we're gonna cover those best practices. All right, so the first thing I need is just, let's get one of the grids set up. And by the way, this is not one single grid. The, what we're gonna do is we are going to build uh, separate grids for these, okay? Because this ultimately gives you more control over things. 
So we're going to just build the first grid, which is an asset and then content. Asset on the left, content on the right, and then we're going to talk about how to make one side bigger than the other. So I'm going to add a div. The div is going to be my grid wrapper. All right. So and we're just going to start kind of by adding components. I have the structure panel open over here. Uh, I will try to name things as well. So we're going to call this grid wrapper. Awesome. Now you can name whatever you name over here. It doesn't matter. That's that's for you. Okay. So whatever makes the most sense to you, go for it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to apply a class to this. And we're going to call this a feature grid or a feature row even, right? Um, so you could say feature row and that, that can just be our custom class. So we'll just go with that. Um, feature row like this. So feature dash row. Now on that class, we are going to enable the grid. So we're going to click the grid button and it's going to ask you the column count. Now, before we get into this, I want you to scroll all the way down and you're going to find this width box. Almost always, you're going to find that you want to set this width to 100%. Now, there's cases where you wouldn't want to do that, but in a, in a situation like this, because we are these are spanning the full width of our, of our page, um, not the full width of the screen, obviously, but the full site width, the, the viewport max of the website, we want that to be 100%. So you set that to 100%. The next thing that we need to do is look at here, this area, where we have default settings from Oxygen. Oxygen is trying to give our grid default settings. And in most cases, we don't want those default settings. I think it should not do this, uh, but I guess they're trying to be a little bit helpful. But in actuality, what they end up doing is creating a situation where your grid may actually break. And this min width is one of those defaults that can absolutely break your grid, depending on what you are trying to do. So almost always, I come and set this min width to zero pixels. I don't, I, I will control my grid, thank you. I don't need this minimum width. Now, if you are auto-fitting the columns, which means that you're basically going to, this is where you would determine the min width. So you say, all right, I'm gonna put items in a grid and every item needs to be this wide. And then you figure out, Oxygen, how many of those items can go in a row based on you know the width of the grid and the width of the elements. But we're not even going to get into that territory. We don't even need to worry about that. So I'm going to turn that off. And when you turn that off, you can just set this minimum width to zero pixels, OK? Now, gap. It's putting a 20 pixel gap into your grid automatically by default. If I change this column count to two, which doesn't matter for right now, and then I just add two divs. I just want to show you. Again, this is kind of a, yeah, we are going to build this thing, but I also want to teach you about the grid builder as we go. You're going to see that there is by default, I don't think this should be the case, but there is 20 pixels of gap in your grid. All right. So that to me is a problem. Um, number one, 20 pixel units are, are um, you know, not accessible. I don't use pixel units. So at the minimum, I would want that to be in rem. Uh, but I also want that to be responsive. And I also want it to follow spacing. Now, in automatic.css, I would use a variable. But we're going to do this completely vanilla. I'm not going to use automatic.css at all for what we're doing. So I'm just going to come down and change this to rem, and I'm going to do a gap of three rem, which is about 30 pixels. Uh, but that's a, a much more accessible uh, unit here. So I'm going to do the same thing for the row gap, okay? And this is only going to matter when things stack on mobile devices, um, which, as you're going to see with the grid builder, is a little bit janky as you start to do the responsiveness uh, for other device sizes. Anyway, I digress, okay? Let's take out these divs because we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So I have my feature row, I have grid enabled. Column count is what we have to talk about next. By default, it is one. We've taken away the minimum width, we've set our gap properly. Now it's time to talk about column count. Now, the thing with grids is when you just set column counts, it tries to make equal columns. So every column is gonna be the same width. So if I do two, and I have two elements in here, like an image. So I'm gonna put an image and an image, and it's doing this stretch thing lately. Uh, I, I don't think it used to do this, but it's not gonna bother us in a minute. Uh, just showing you that both of these images are the same width, right? 
Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my grid wrapper. If I set this to three, I am going to get another column of equal width, all right? It made all of the columns smaller to fit a third column. So if you just try to say, well, I need two columns or three columns or four columns and you don't use column spans, you can never create a grid where one cell is smaller than another cell. Now in grid, this is called fractional units, right? But that's a really long, complicated word. So we're gonna think about this in parts, right? So we have two parts to three parts. Just think about it that way, right? This is a not three and three, it's two and three. Or it could be one and three, or it could be two and four, whatever you want it to be, right? But if we think about it in parts and we think about this as being two and this as being three, and then we add those together, what we actually have is five. Three plus two is five. And this is gonna make a lot more sense as we go into this. I'm gonna take out these terrible images and we are going to add a five column grid. So now we have five columns to work with. When you have five columns to work with, you can make one of the cells take up two of those columns and another one of the cells take up three of those columns. And then you've used all of your columns, right? So two parts to three parts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add two divs. All right, so we're gonna add a div and we're gonna add another div. I can just duplicate. And what you're gonna see when you first add them is that there's just two really small grids because there's three extra spaces that aren't being taken up. So now what I'm gonna do is go to the grid wrapper where I enabled the grid. I have my two child elements. I don't wanna to touch those right now. I just wanna to touch the parent because the parent controls the grid structure. And in oxygen, the parent also controls the children. All right, so if you scroll down here, you're gonna see these child span overrides. And what these two boxes are is a visual representation of the cells that I have added to the grid. Not all the available cells, just the cells that I've added, right? So if I added another one, you will see three boxes down there instead of two. Because when I click on one, this is how I can override their, its span. So it's only showing me the divs that I've added into the grid container. So I'm gonna delete that because I only need two, right? There's only two containers here. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm grabbing my wrapper, my whole grid wrapper, and I'm going to override the first one with a column span of two. I'm gonna override the second one by clicking on it with a column span of three. And now you see I have two columns. One is two parts and one is three parts. Make sense? Okay, so we're getting somewhere. Now, a lot of you might wonder, hey, Kevin, let me go ahead and save this while we're here. So save as, is that a scalable vector graphic? Okay, that's an SVG. So we'll just say asset. And now I'm gonna come over here and pop that in. And a lot of you are gonna wonder, image, browse, all right, where's my downloads? Here's asset.svg and select. Okay, so we've added that asset. So you might wonder, hey, Kevin, why did you add a div when you don't need a div? You could just put the image in there in that position and it's gonna do the exact same thing. It is an extra div, which means it is an extra DOM element. However, it gives you more control. It's, it's more future-proof. So yes, I add the extra div for my image wrapper basically, uh, but it gives you more control in the future. Here's an, a prime example. Sometimes uh, you'll, you'll have built something, right? And they'll do like a design refresh and the designer will put some little accent on the images um, or behind the images or whatever. And you have to use pseudo elements before and after. If you watch my tutorial, pseudo elements before and after, you have to put those pseudo elements on the image. The problem is you can't put pseudo elements on an image. But if you have an image wrapper, a div around your image, you can attach those design elements to that div and you're good to go. If this scenario that I just laid out happens to you and you haven't used that extra div, you are now faced with rebuilding all of your grids that have assets, image assets, if, the, if that needs to happen. So you would have to go and add a div around that image in every grid that you've built across the entire site. So for me, it's just like, it's not gonna really hurt anything, but it gives us a lot of uh, flexibility going forward. It also gives you uh, added flexibility with things like padding and borders and, and things like that. So 
Just add the div, take my advice, add the div, put the image in the div, all right? And you're gonna see how we name all of these things in a minute, which is absolutely critical for future proofing as well. So that's that. Now on the content side, we need a text, we need a heading, we need text, and we need a button, okay? I'm not gonna do this whole toggle thing. We're not gonna, this is not part of the tutorial, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we're talking about grid structure here. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is add the text. I'm gonna add a heading. Uh, that's going to be an H2. I'm going to add more text, and then I'm going to add a button. All right, button. Perfect. We're just going to do that. The one thing I will do is just do button primary from automatic CSS. Okay, just so we have a little bit of style there. All right, so choose a view. We're just going to copy this text. And then we're going to add the heading. The board is just the beginning. And I'm also gonna show you how to improve this kind of design because if you see their content is like towards the top of the asset, it's not really middle aligned. I really like middle alignment on this and I like a little bit more breathing room. So we'll see if we can actually improve the design a little bit as well. All right, um, I will use some, just to make colors and things like that easier, we'll use some automatic CSS classes, but, uh, or variables actually. Okay, so we have all of our components. What does that button need to say? And we'll just make it say learn more. Now, very important here, what you want to do before you do anything else is more custom classes. You've got to put your custom classes. This is where we're getting into best practices, okay? So there's a bunch of components here. We have the grid wrapper. This is the image wrapper right here. I'm not adding classes yet. I'm just naming things in the structure panel. Um, image is fine. We can leave that. This is going to be our content wrapper, and you can see it highlighted as I edit the name of it. So content wrapper. But it's, it's really a feature row content wrapper, right? So I'm going to show you how to do all of this in just a second. This is going to be the accent heading. It's not really a heading, but it serves the purpose of a heading. Uh, this is going to be the heading. That's fine. That's the text. That's fine. And that's the button. That's fine. Okay. So here's how we do the custom classes. So what I'm going to do is grab my image. I'm grabbing the image, right? This is going to be a feature row double underscore image, feature row image, or you could say feature row asset if it maybe was going to be a video or something that's not, uh, you know, doesn't have to be an image. Um, but I'm just going to do image because these are all images. So feature row image, boom. So now I'm going to hit this little up arrow and it's going to select the parent uh, of this element, which is the div that's around that image. And this is going to be called a feature row and then we're going to do double underscore again. This is BEM, B-E-M, naming convention. Okay, so it's tying all of these things together properly. So this is an image dash wrapper. So it's a feature row image wrapper. Now on this side, we have another wrapper here, which is the content wrapper. So I am going to select that and we're going to do feature row double underscore content wrapper. Now I'm gonna grab the uh, little subheading or accent heading here, and I'm gonna call this feature row double underscore accent heading. I'm gonna grab this. I'm gonna say this is a feature row double underscore heading. I'm gonna grab this and say this is a feature row double underscore text, or you could say blurb or whatever you wanna do here, but you've gotta make sure that these custom classes are here. Now this has a, utility class on it, a button primary. What we could also do here is if you really wanted to, to do it, we can do feature row double underscore. And there's two ways to do this, okay? Uh, you can do button, and then you could literally style the button, or you could just put a utility class on it as well. So you're like stacking the classes. And that gives you a quick way to style that button, but you also have it future-proofed where if you need to change anything, you can target this feature row button to make changes to the button. But you can get away with, this is a little bit of cheat speed um, to just put a utility class on that button and be done with it, okay? All right, so now what you're gonna notice based on our grid is that our asset is much taller than our content. And you see this in the fact that this cell right here does not go all the way to the bottom. So if I wanted to align this, I can still align it, uh, but the easiest thing to do is to use a stretch, which makes this div right here stretch all the way and use up the available space that is in the grid. So I'm going to grab the parent grid. I'm on the class feature row 
and we are going to stretch. You can stretch just to be safe both of these, okay? So we put a stretch on. Now you didn't see anything move, but if I hover over the cell, you see that cell now spans the entire height of the div container. That's really important, okay? The next thing that we can do, what I like to do, I don't like this top aligned, is I like to, in my feature row content wrapper, this cell on that class, I'm going to do a vertical alignment and then middle, just like that. And that's gonna do it for every grid automatically because these classes are being used. The next thing I'm gonna do is grab my wrapper and I'm just gonna change my gap because I said I like a more breathing room uh, than what Trello has. Their content is really close to their asset. I'm gonna do a little bit wider of a gap here and I'm gonna do five rim on the row as well. Okay, so now what we do is we space these items out. So I'm gonna grab this heading and I'm on the class. You need to make sure you're on the class and I'm gonna do margin top. Uh, I will hook into automatic CSS variables here but you could very easily use rems or whatever. You're just gonna to have to make sure that everything is responsive. But with automatic CSS variables, everything is automatically responsive. So I don't really have to worry about it. So I'm gonna do space S and then on this one, I'm going to basically hit none and paste the exact same thing. And then on this button, which is the feature row button now, I'm not, I'm not editing my utility class, right? And you'll see that in automatic CSS, everything is locked by default because you don't really wanna be doing that. So you have this custom class and that's where you're gonna add your margin top. Boom, and I'll, I'll actually change this to M so that we have a little bit more of a gap there. And then this one, I can actually adjust to XS, which is extra small. So I have, it's tighter here and then wider here. Sometimes I, I like that flow a little bit better. On this text, I'm also gonna do var, and we're gonna do like shade medium. So we're just gonna use like a lighter color, just like Trello did with theirs. Theirs is a little bit thicker font, but whatever. Uh, and then choose a view, we're just gonna style that up real quick. And again, I'm always on these custom classes, right? So uh, font size there doesn't really need to change, but we do need to uppercase it. And then, oh, we actually do need to change the font size. So we're gonna go var text S, and then I am going to do font weight of like 600, and then we'll probably do letter spacing of like 0.025M, uh, how about 0.05M, something like that. And okay, I don't think that needs to change colors at all, uh, but we could. Let's do like a, let's do a var primary right? Something like that. Adds a little bit of, uh, I don't know. I don't know what it adds. <laughs> All right. So let's move on. Now what we have to do, we've, we've done really good here. Um, we do have to do mobile now. And mobile is challenging when you're using column spans. So let's first thing we're going to do is just take a look at like, what do we look like at 1280 pixels and below? Uh, to me, it looks pretty good. All right, so we're gonna go back. And I also wanna do this, by the way, I'm gonna do image. I don't think we ever put a width on that. Let's just safely put a width of 100% on that. And let's go back to 1280 and take another look. So I think we're good there, but I, I, I'm gathering that we're not gonna be good at any point below this. So we're gonna go to 992. And that's where you get into that Trello view where it was like, here, let me inspect this, where the asset got really small, which I don't think I like. So we're gonna try to avoid that but I'll show you real quick. So as they come down, the asset gets really small and then the, the text stays the way that it is. I guess if we wanna mimic Trello, we could, we could continue to do that. Let's see what the next breakpoint does. That's definitely not gonna work, right? Um, so eh, I guess just for the sake of this, let's leave it the way that Trello does it. All right, so I'm gonna come down to 768 and now we need to break the grid. So we need to change our grid. So now what we're effectively going to, actually, no, let's, let's not do this. I, I'm, I'm thinking on the fly here because I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about adding more things into the tutorial for you. Let's make this an even grid now. So instead of this being small and this being a bit bigger, remember this is two parts to three parts, let's do them equal now. So you can change the grid structure at different breakpoints. So I, I have the wrapper, I'm on my class, I'm at the breakpoint I wanna change it on. I'm going to enable the grid at this breakpoint. And you're gonna see that it blows the thing up. And the reason it blows the grid up is because it defaults, once again, I said, I don't like that oxygen defaults to this stuff. It defaults to one column. I don't want 
one column. I want two columns. I want two equal columns. So I'm going to hit two. And you're going to notice that my grid is still broken. Because even though the grid did not inherit my column count from the previous setting, it did inherit my spans. <laughs> so if you don't know that this is happening, it can totally freak you out. It can totally like trip you up. You have no idea what's going on with your grid. It's not behaving the way you're telling it to behave. It's because of the spans. And that's why I said, when you're using spans, it makes it a little bit tougher on mobile unless you know exactly what's going on, right? Behind the scenes. So I'm gonna change this to two. And again, look at this, it's filled in a 200 pixel max width on me again. So I'm gonna have to zero that out. It's also changed my gap once again, which I don't like, right? Um, and I don't know if it actually changes it or if those are just kind of like placeholders now, but just to be safe, uh, well, what did I do? I did five rim. We can actually do like three rim now because we don't need as much on, on mobile spacing. So I'm gonna change this to three rim. If you're using automatic CSS, you can I absolutely use my spacing hooks there, um, but I'm gonna try to do that as little as possible. Okay, so we have a two column grid, but obviously we don't have two columns. That's because we had to come down to our child span overrides. And now what do we want? We want each uh, cell to be one fractional unit, to, to be one part, one part to one part, right? So I'm gonna put a one in there. And then on this cell over here, I'm gonna put a one. And now you see they are equal. So we have effectively changed the grid structure at this breakpoint. If I go to the desktop, I have the original grid structure. If I go to 992, I have the new grid structure. And now at one breakpoint below, I have to do this again. I have to enable the grid. I do want the one column count. I don't want my min width again. Um, I, my gap is going to be rim, back to rim. So we're going to do three rim on that. And this is going to be three rim as well, okay? And now I have my asset and my text stacking one on top of the other. So I do now have a completely responsive grid. We're going to save our work. We're going to go to the front end. Now we're not done by any means. We have to do the other rows. We have to do the auto staggering. We have to do uh, switching order automatically on mobile devices, right? So, so much more to come. But here is the start of what we've got going on. Uh, and I'm gonna enable the inspector and I am going to hit here. And I, I am going a little bit slower, guys, because I said this is a follow along tutorial. I'm explaining more things about the process than I do sometimes. But if we take a look at this, we have a responsive grid and everything has the proper structure as far as custom classes and really good naming conventions and all of that. All right, so let's go ahead and move on. I am going to grab this entire wrapper and I'm going to duplicate it. Okay, now these two rows obviously are much too close to each other. So now what I can do is I can, one of two ways, right? You can add, it doesn't really matter in this case because you're gonna have to use a, uh, uh, last of type or first of type or something like that. I'll explain exactly what I mean, but we need to space these out. So what I'm gonna do, the easiest thing to do is feature row, size and spacing, margin bottom. I am gonna hook in for this just to make it responsive. So space L, uh, let's do XL. So I have XL spacing between these on the margin bottom. The problem is that my last uh, grid is also going to have a margin bottom on it, even though there may not be anything underneath it. So what I want to do is automatically tell this structure, the last thing, the last of this type, right? The last row of this type should have no margin bottom. It should have zero margin bottom. And we can do that very easily with a little CSS, but we don't even have to write the CSS. We can just add it inside of Oxygen. So I'm holding my wrapper here, my feature row. I'm gonna hit this state button. You're not gonna see it in the dropdown. You have to know it exists and you have to add it manually. So you're gonna hit add state and you're gonna type the words first dash of dash type. And that's, sorry, this is gonna be last of type. There is first of type and there's last of type. So the first item of this type or the last item of this type, I wanna do something to it. So you're gonna hit okay with after you type in last of type. And you're going to see that it changes right here to last of type. And now anything you do in here with styling affects the last 
of this type of element, right? Which is gonna be this one right here. Or if I added another one, it would be the next one, okay? So I'm gonna go down to size and spacing, margin, bottom, zero. And what you're gonna notice is the margin is still here, but it's not here. And I will prove that to you by adding a button or anything, really, you can add any element. And that button is right up against the grid, even though it's not up against this grid right here, right? Because there is still a gap between after this one. There is still margin bottom on this one. And if I, if I duplicate this grid, there will be a gap here, but there will, no, be, well, there will be no gap after the last one because we changed the last of type to zero. That's how last of type works. Super, super handy. All right. Uh, we can probably just leave these three grids here. Now, what we want is every second grid, we actually want to swap these two things. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is change the order of the either the asset or the content wrapper. And we're going to only do that for every second one. So we're not going to do this manually. We're going to do this automatically. Now, you do have to write, uh, actually, you don't have to write, you don't have to go to a style sheet. You are going to have to write a little CSS, but it's like one line, okay? Um, but we're going to do it inside of Oxygen, or we're going to try to, I do it in style sheets, just to let you know, I do it in style sheets. But I'm trying to avoid style sheets. I want this to be as vanilla and kind of beginner as possible and easy to follow along with. Uh, and I know CSS is scary for some people, so we're going to do as little of that as possible. Now, if something doesn't end up working, I may have to resort to style sheets, but uh, I don't know. We're, we're going to figure it out as we go. So with my parent wrapper selected, my feature row, we're going to do something called nth of type. So we did, we just did, uh, if you remember, last of type and first of type. Now we're going to do nth of type, which is another crazy one, right? So we're going to hit add state and we're on the feature row and we're going to say nth of type. And then you put it in parentheses, you say two in. So that's like every second uh, of this type, every second item of this type. And I'm gonna hit, okay. And all we're gonna do, just to make sure that we've targeted this properly, we're gonna go to borders and we're gonna do uh, a two pixel solid border. And oxygen always screws up here, by the way. Like it's, it, mad lag whenever you're edit editing borders. I don't know if that happens for you, but whenever I'm doing anything with borders, mad lag. But check this out. We now have a border around the second item of that type. Now let's test it out. If I duplicate this last one, there will now be four. I want every second one. So the fourth one and the second one should both have a border automatically without me touching it. So I duplicate and look, that one now has a border. Let's look at that on the front end, just as so you can see it. So I refresh, there's my border, and there's my border. So every second of that type is getting a border. That is critical. So that's just to test. I don't actually want to do that. So I'm going to go to nth of type to n, and I am going to go to borders, and we are going to go to none. We don't want borders on. See how much lag there is between when I click that button and when the borders went away? And if you type in this color box, oh man, <laughs> good luck to you, my friend. Okay. Uh, hold on, my alarm is going off on my phone. Let's turn that off. Okay, perfect. So what did I say we wanted to do? We wanted to flip the order. Uh, we are we are going to have to write some CSS. I, I apologize. Um, there may be a way to do this in the builder, but I, I don't want to go off the rails completely. So we're going to go to manage style sheets. I will walk you through it. Have no fear. You're going to add a style sheet and you can call this like grids or like whatever you want. Um, Anything that you do with grids, like custom grids, you may want to put in here. So I am going to add a comment. This is called a comment. I'm going to zoom in on this so you guys can see better. This is going to be called feature rows, right? So anytime you come along in the future and you're like, where is that code that I added? Okay, it's all commented, right? Like you can see there's a little heading. This does not get printed in the CSS. All right, so what we're going to do Remember, we're targeting our grid. What is our grid called? It's called feature row. So we're just going to put a dot. That's for class. And I'm going to do feature row. So we are targeting something in the feature row. We don't know what we're targeting yet, but that's where we're starting. Okay. Um, and if you were just targeting the feature row, you would put your little curly brackets and then you would start going to work on your styling. But we need to actually target something else. 
So we are targeting uh, the feature row int child to in, just like we did in the builder a second ago. So we're going to go, uh, and not int child, we're going to do int of type. So we're going to do int of type to in. And let's just see border one pixel solid red. Do we have it? You guys might not be able to see that. Let me do five pixel. So it's obvious. So we have written the CSS correctly. And this is how you do the um, the the pseudo classes. Sorry, my, it's early. My brain's not working. Um, pseudo classes are a colon and then the pseudo class. Um, so exactly like what we put in the oxygen builder, we're just typing it out. So feature row nth of type 2n is getting a border five pixel solid red. That is obviously working. But we need to target something inside of that feature row, inside of every second feature row. What are we going to target? We're going to target this content wrapper. So I know because all of my class names are very organized that if I put a dot and I do feature row double underscore content wrapper, I can now target that content wrapper and we'll go back and we'll take a look. There it is, feature row content wrapper. Remember when we did our namings? So I'll go back. Now let's do a border here and just see if we're targeting properly, right? So border five pixels solid red, there it is. We're now we're targeting that element. So that's all good. So now the question is, what do we need to do to that element? Well, we need to change its position in the grid. So we can use the order property to change its position in the grid. So the thing with order is you don't like choose a number order. You're not like position one, position two, like that. That's not really how it works. I mean, it is a little bit, but for two elements, it's not really how it works. So minus one is actually first, right? Um, so, cause I think the default is zero. So if I put order one, nothing happens. And you might think like, oh my gosh, like I want it like in the first position. Why isn't it going to the first position? because minus one is actually the first position, okay? So you're gonna put order minus one, and you see right there, they just flip-flopped. Only in the second of that type did they flip-flop, which is really, really cool. So I'm gonna hit save. We're gonna go back to the front end, I'm gonna zoom out. We're gonna go back to the front end, and let's turn off this responsive thing here. How do I, okay, I'm not used to Firefox yet. All right, so we're gonna refresh. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. What do we do? Save. I'm getting it in the builder, but not on the front end. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. Something has happened. <laughs> Something has happened because we still have borders here as well. And I clearly don't have borders. Okay. Let me do, let me just delete this nth of type two in. Save. Okay. So now we have an auto staggered grid right? Which is great because you can go in and change the content on all this. I'm not going to do that because it's a waste of everybody's time, but you would just go change the content to match what is going on here. You change the image, swap this, none of that matters, right? All the classes stay the same. Everything stays the same. It's literally just, you know, the grunt work of migrating the content over. Um, I'm also wondering why this is like, oh gosh, it's like taking away padding. It's like, all oh, okay. I'm going to save and refresh. We're just going to get to a clean slate here. We're back. All right, so now what we're gonna do, we're not done. So we auto staggered, but watch this, this is so cool. So I grab my, my row, if I want more rows, I can just duplicate and it swaps it automatically. I duplicate, it swaps it back. I duplicate again, it swaps it back. And then the question is, is everything responsive? So now we take a look. So we come down, yes, look at that. It still looks perfect at that breakpoint. We come down and now we have the problem. The big problem is now the order of things because it's image, content, content, image. This is what I said in the beginning, you did not want. So what we have to do is just swap the positions back on mobile devices. And the break point that we have to know is 768. That is the break point where they stack. At this break point, we don't wanna switch anything. That's 992. But at 768, we wanna swap again. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave this window open right here and we're gonna go back into our style sheets. Now this one is a little bit more complicated because we have to use what's called a media query. So we are telling uh, the code to only apply to certain breakpoints, okay? So we're gonna just do at media. Now there's a lot of things that you can do with at media. You can do screen, all, yada, 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 okay? I'm just gonna do the shorthand version, which is at media and then parentheses. 
and then we can open brackets. What we put in this parentheses is the breakpoint. Now you have max width and you have min width. Max width means that that breakpoint and below, I want these things to happen. Min width is I, at this breakpoint and above, I want these things to happen. We're gonna use max width because we want at 768 and below, we wanna swap the images again. So I'm gonna say max width, and then you use a colon, and then you do 760, not 758, 768 pixels. So at max width 768 pixels and below, I want whatever I put in here to happen. Well, what do I want to have happen? So uh, I can now prioritize. Remember I switched the content wrapper to position one? What I really wanna do is prioritize assets now. The, the images need to be first, okay? So I'm gonna do feature row, and I'm gonna do, I, I can actually just do this to all of them. I don't actually have to tar target the nth of type two in. Uh, I don't believe, we're just gonna try this shortcut here. And then I'm gonna do feature row image wrapper, the whole div that contains that image. And then I'm gonna open my curly brackets, okay? So inside of here, I want this to be order minus one. And you saw, I believe over here, everything just fixed itself. So now automatically I have image, content, image, content, image, content, because we just told it, hey, the image at this breakpoint and below needs to be in the first position, okay? Or really the image wrapper. All right, so I'm gonna hit save on that. And now we're gonna go back to the front end and we're gonna take a look at what our grid is doing here. So I have a perfect grid the way I want it right here. And as I break down, so let's go to inspect, let's go to mobile. As I break down, everything looks good. That's where it's swapped to the two columns even, two even columns. So right here, it's staggered columns or like uh, three part, two part. And now it comes down and boom, you can see it right there. It switches to equal parts. And then we come down and it stacks. And the stacking is the perfect order. And the good thing about this is we don't need any other classes. You don't need any swap classes. You don't need to do all this manually. And you can now reuse this structure on any page you want to use it on. So any, let's say the company has 10 different products and every products, every product page needs its own features, right? You can use this feature row structure on all those pages and automatically now you have full responsiveness, you have auto staggering, you have auto ordering of the assets and the content, everything is perfect. And if you need to change anything in the future, you change it on one of these structures because we use all of these custom classes and it will update everywhere across the entire website. I hope that this was a really great intro tutorial for the grid builder. I tried to do something a little bit more advanced. So there's beginner stuff in here. There's advanced stuff in here. Let me go back to, to screen. So we did beginner level stuff, we did intermediate level stuff, we did somewhat advanced level stuff, but we also gave you a really practical thing that you can use and, and do on client sites like across the board. This is the type of stuff that will really elevate your game and make your life so much easier as a developer because if you do have those 10 product pages with these feature grids, but you did them all manually, or you did them all with utility classes, and then the client's like, ooh, I don't like how it staggers like that, or I don't like how the image is above the content, I'm I'm a dummy and I want the image below the content, right? Like, doesn't matter what they say. Or like I said in the beginning, you need to add some pseudo elements to your image wrappers. Uh, whatever the case may be, you are fully future-proof and protected because of the way that we structured this, all right? If you have any questions, I want you to drop a comment below. If you loved this tutorial, I want you to hit the like button. I want you to make sure you're subscribed to this channel. I want you to make sure that you've hit the little bell notification so that anytime I post new tutorials, you get notified. And uh, that's it. If you do have any questions, I am happy, more than happy to help you. So uh, that's it for me today, though. I'll see you guys back again here real soon. Peace.